All right. American lives are taken every 11 minutes. 46.8 million Americans, age 12 and older, are battling a substance use disorder this past year. Almost 21 million Americans have at least one addiction, and yet only 10% of them receive treatment. More than 70% of people who tried an illegal drug before the age of 13 have an addiction to drugs or alcohol. Because of these stats and many more like them, this is why I'm going to be talking about addiction in our society. So first I'd like to start off with what is addiction? Or oh, sorry, these are the topics I'm going to be talking about today. Kinds of addictions, impact on adolescents, dopamine, importance of control, solution, and then my biblical integration. So what is addiction? I'm sure that everyone in this room already has somewhat of an understanding of what addiction is. Um, when I was looking for a definition, all the definitions were, they all differed, and it's, since it's so complex and broad, it's a very hard topic to, devi to define. So when I was doing my research, I found a source called Drug Abuse, or er, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. This helped me throughout my presentation and paper. It gave me a lot of good information. And I used their definition because I thought it was best fitting, um, which states, addiction is a chronic disease that has a major impact on both the function and structure of the brain. Now, when I say chronic disease, you might be thinking like addiction as a disease. You never thought of that or because that's what I was thinking. I was like, I've never heard of, it, heard of it as a disease. But the reason they say this is because how similar it is to diseases such as heart disease and many others. For example, in comparison, both of these diseases disrupt the normal health and functioning of an organ in the body. Both have serious harmful effects, and both are in many cases preventable and treatable. With this being said, I'd like to go on to kinds of addiction. So here we have, before learning about addiction, this sets as a huge foundation. Um, these are the two main categories that addictions are all categorized in substance use disorders and behavioral addictions. So substance use disorders are when substances, uh, things that have the potential to become addictive, such as alcohol, cannabis, caffeine, opioids, um, tobacco, nicotine, Adderall, all these things, uh, they fall in the hands of someone that who lacks control. And these are found throughout our society and are greatly affecting our generation. Now let's move on to behavioral addictions. Behavior, sorry. Behavioral addictions are um, addictions that, or activities that stimulate the reward system of the brain. For example, eating, gambling, shopping, running, or exercising, video games, sex. There's a lot of activities that have the potential to become addictive. Therefore, it is extremely important to keep a close eye on these activities and make sure they are not generating a negative effect on the individual. Overall, due to the broadness and seriousness of addiction, obtaining a better understanding of the certain groups and kinds that are found throughout society is crucial when working toward a solution. Impact on adolescence. As seen today, addiction targets all kinds of audiences. However, now more than ever, it focuses greatly on adolescence in society. Due to the vulnerability of adolescents, addiction can take over and spread like wildfire. For example, growing up in a ge generation where many people's lives revolve around the thing that sits in their pocket, um, one major addiction that we have all witnessed is social media. Too many people waste precious time scrolling through TikTok and social media and doing things that they won't even remember the next day. Not only this, but social media is also negatively affecting many individuals and adolescents due to its nature and how it's used. Um, I know that somebody in this room was, I don't know if they're still doing it, but they were doing a presentation on comparison. Comparison is a huge thing on social media. You see what people want you to see and you don't think of it like their own social media is only showing the good, which is why social media plays a whole or a huge part in addiction. This is where it comes in. Um, scrolling through social media and such can cause depression, anxiety, stress, and this is where addiction strikes. As a result of how difficult growing up can be, McLean Hospital reports that oftentimes adolescents are curious, stressed, emotional, and looking for ways to escape boredom. Adolescents are also more likely to experiment with substances due to the way the brain develops. Sometimes when given the opportunity, they'll find an escape through drugs, alcohol, and while substance use might fit, or fit the bill at the moment, it can lead to long-term struggles, including addiction. 
So now I'd like to talk about dopamine. Dopamine is known as the feel-good hormone. Dopamine is also almost always brought up when talking about addiction. It not only gives the individual a sense of pleasure, but it can also be the underlying motivation to obtain a certain feeling again. So looking back on Bo's presentation, who isn't here, um, he did his presentation on technology, and I know he talked about do dopamine. When an individual opens an app, whether it's Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, whatever it may be, as they scroll, their brain receives dopamine from the content. This is why after doom scrolling, I like that term that Bo used, um, after doom scrolling, individuals might feel tired or unmotivated to do anything the rest of the day. While I was researching dopamine and its role in the topic of addiction, I found a TED talk by a man named Scott McFadden, and it's called a story of, or Addiction, A Story of Stigma, A Story of Hope. Scott McFadden got, um, his first time trying drugs was in high school. He was at the age of 15. His friends introduced him to, I think it was meth, and he took his first shot, or injected it, and um, that summer, he thought he was going to be able to get off it. He's like, just, I'm just going to do it for the summer. Next week, I'm going to be done. So the summer came around. He ended up getting hooked. He ended up trying every drug imaginable, and it led him to a very bad place. He ended up going in prison because he got addicted to heroin. He got caught with a pen on him. However, once he ended, that's when he realized, uh, if this is what drugs do, I'm through. However, once he got out, he immediately started using whatever he could get his hands on. Long story short, after this event, Scott was in and out of prison, in and out of rehab, and it wasn't until he tried to take his own life that he was finally able to gain the willpower to stop. Next, uh, still on dopamine, Scott talks about, after he talks about his story, he talks about the importance of dopamine and its levels. So, this chart is a bit confusing just because he said that um, like a perfect day, you'll be receiving 100 nanograms of dopamine. So I don't know why sex is above 100 because it's not our bodies aren't made. He said our bodies aren't made to go beyond 100. But uh, so on a normal day, it might be around 50 nanograms. You have enough motivation to get out of bed. You go to school, go to work, have a solid day. On a bad day or pretty lazy day, it might be 30 or 40 nanograms. You barely can get up at, get out of bed. You don't want to go to work. And then on a perfect day, say you have a soccer game, you win, you have a basketball game, your favorite team won, you got tickets to a concert, whatever it may be, your nanogram levels, or your dopamine levels will be around 90 to 100 nanograms. And like I said before, your body's not meant to go beyond that. However, uh, I don't know if I said it earlier, I may have, but Scott McFadden, when he took his first shot of meth, he claims that his body was over, his body was gained around 1,100 nanograms of dopamine. As you can tell by that, that's just, an absurd amount and truly here we can see here um, meth is around 13 to 1400 heroin's around 1100 to 1200 so this shows how truly dangerous drugs are and um, that they go beyond the limit of your body until and which is why it's so important because they once they once you feel this good which you're not supposed to feel um, your body tells itself to do whatever it takes to feel that again. Now I'd like to talk about the importance of control. How do I know if I'm addicted? How does addiction start? What is the difference between heavy use and addiction? All these questions and many more are answered by control. Um, control is a huge factor that is almost always brought up when talking about addiction. Not only does it answer questions like these, but it also serves as a backbone for many. Excuse me. Having control over a substance or activity is oftentimes what can make it or break it for an individual. Meaning the difference between somebody that goes out for a drink every once in a while and the alcoholic is the control that one has over alcohol and the other doesn't. As I talked about earlier, the spark for both the substance use disorders and behavioral addictions can start with just somebody lacking control. Is there a solution? If so, what? Now, when I put this question on my slides, I was like, I didn't, I didn't quite know if I wanted to because I figured somebody might ask in the crowd. But um, it's a very hard question to answer. To give you the true, honest answer, um, I would say that there is a solution 
Um, the National Institute on Drug Abuse claims that there's no cure, but there's treatment. And when I was doing research, I found that most of the time that if the victim doesn't want to change, there's not going to be change. The victim has to have the mindset and willingness to change because you can force them to rehab. You can force them to become sober for a couple of days, a couple of weeks. But at the end of the day, it all depends on the individual. And that said, it's reality, but that's why addiction is so dangerous. Here's my biblical, biblical integration. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 6 through 8. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us sober, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. I believe that the main, pas the main idea of this passage is to express to the reader the importance of not only taking care of yourself, but also the significance of seeking and understanding certain prophetic matters and events. Instead of wasting your life that you have been blessed with on material I materialistic idols and goods, take a step back and look at the bigger picture. With your time on earth, work to become the best follower of God you, you can be. Do not throw your life away, but use the gifts and abilities that you have been given to prepare yourself to be saved by the Lord. My next biblical integration is 1 Corinthians 10, verses 13 through 14. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. I believe that the main idea of this passage is to serve as an example for Christians today. Um, idolatry and many other things like idolatry is a huge problem and was a huge problem that heavily conflicts our religion. To prevent the bad from happening, God has blessed us with many pieces of scripture to serve as our God. He has presented us with history that shows what will happen if we do not listen and obey him. This is why we as Christians must work to elude the, from the distractions of the world and make sure our number one focus and priority is the Lord. Thank you. start with that like that bit of integration was great because I like how you it's, it's interesting to me like God's solution to addiction is not to take it away um, all right let me rephrase that God's solution to temptation is not to take it away you know it's not there's no guarantee in scripture that you'll go through your life just not tempted by anything and it and and there is this really tight connection between what an addict experiences on a regular basis and being tempted by stuff right um talk about triggers and, and things like that that make you want to, to take or whatever. Um, but but that's that's a really, really good connection there. Sorry, that was, I thought it was just right on my mind as you finished that. Um, I thought it was really fascinating about the dopamine thing. Like I, I, I don't know that I've ever seen it charted like that, mm -hmm. that this is how much, like everybody talks about dopamine, like it's like a hot topic. I like, I, I really like that chart. That was really helpful to see in comparison that, um, yeah, like a, a good meal, that's, a, that's what makes it a good meal, yeah. right? Versus methamphetamines, which yeah. is like, that just seems like a ungodly, unhealthy amount mm -hmm. that, that your brain just, on it, it's overloading, right? Um, I wonder if though, like, and maybe you can tell me a little bit about this, that the nature of addiction is that you get that immediate high, is from that point forward, is there is there a diminishing return from that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I actually didn't say this, but I have it down here. Um, I don't remember where I said it, but I talked about how when doing I'll go back to this left. When doing a drug or using a drug, when you receive that amount of dopamine, um, the reason it can be so dangerous and deadly is because first time you use it is the best. You'll never reach that point again. So that's why it can be it can absolutely destroy people's lives because they'll do it the first time. They won't realize what they're doing, and they'll try so hard to get back to that point, but they never can. Yeah. That's why they do whatever it takes to get their hands on it. And uh, at the end of the day, just they can throw their life away to try to get back to that point. But right. and I wonder, I wonder if that's like. And, and I also another thing that I had written down. I really like the distinction between substance addiction and behavioral addiction. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there's something. There, there's something significant about the fact that like these substances here are the kind of thing that 
not only are you getting this spike that you'll never achieve again, but it's it's diminishing your health more and more yeah. as you partake in it, right? Yeah. Whereas other things like um, you know, people can get addicted to working out or whatever, right? Um, but there's a way to do it to where you actually increase the satisfaction, yeah. increase the as opposed to it taking more and more from you every time. R- real fascinating. So um, yeah, classmates, I'll give you time for one because we got another presentation to get to. Anybody have? Someone off the top of their head for Friday? CC? Um, so I really think it was the passion that was spoken in the Bible at church. It was, it's kind of more of the um, beginning of the argument that if we can get rid of it, but the fact that once we become Christians, we do, um, there's a way to serve like that, that we do serve something that can really be the only thing to lose it, and that we just lose the need to want to serve each other. Okay. Okay, so like he thinks that addiction is more of a choice than, okay. So I would say that um, I kind of agree in that in that way. I definitely do think it depends a lot on the individual and how they look at it. Um, I understand that I think from that question, I would say that he's thinking of it more as like a disease is something that you kind of could just be handed and you can't really control. And I guess if you go deep and you're just like, all right, you have bad health, it's not surprising that you got heart disease or whatever. But yeah, I would say um, it definitely it definitely can be a choice. I don't know exactly. I would say maybe even if it is a choice, it could still be a disease just because that once the individual takes, chooses to, yeah, honestly, yeah, I would agree. I like that question a lot. I think it absolutely is a choice because it's the individual's choice to 